Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by I truly believe that Forrest Carter was trying to raise the American Indian image to its highest ideal. And I think that's what made the education of Little Tree so touching and so warm. Little Tree was the story of his childhood as an Indian boy. He had grown up on a reservation, and he was orphaned. He was taken away from his grandparents. He was raised by these missionary types. And he got through this, and he got through it well. I started reading it at work, and I cried at my desk while I was reading it. The education of Little Tree captured people's emotion and it was about being proper and helping a fellow man. It's meant a lot to a lot of people. Forrest is a, a wonderful human being. I think I kept thinking, I'm lucky to know him. I was told that there was a graveside service first for people gathered from uh, Hollywood and New York, some of the publishing people who had come down. India and, and the children were there at the same time. And these people left. And an hour or two later, the whole family went back and uh, uh, there was another service for uh, somebody called Asa Earl Carter. We commit Asa Carter to his final rest. And to your I understand that they had put a headstone as far as Carter, and then they changed it to Asa Earl Carter. And there was quite a bit of interest in who was it. I was at a conference at Rocky Mountain National Park and called my office just to see how everything was going, and I found that The Education of Little Tree was not the book I thought it was. I was, you know, astonished, of course. <laughs> You had a legislature down there three-fourths colored. They voted by sticking their feet in the air. Here's the education of Little Tree, promoting peace, stability, and the spiritual ways of the Cherokee. This is a white man's show, conceived by a white man, maintained by a white man. It turns out Forrest Carter doesn't really exist. This is Asa Carter, a man who's one of the most notorious racists in the state of Alabama. And yet, he's able to fool all of these people. The Negro can get away with anything in the school. He can insult them, he can knife them, he can curse, he can tear up the dead. You ask the little children are being knifed and brutalized, and the little girls who are having their future Christian homes. I cannot believe that this is Forrest Carter. This is Asa Carter. May God bless you. Thank you for listening.
I'm totally, completely disgusted what I saw in the video. I mean, that wasn't the person I knew. I mean, it wasn't even close. It's amazing. It's just a flat amazing. I wonder, uh, when did he change? When did he decide he, did he ever change, you know? It's been said Forrest Carter's greatest story was the one he could never tell, his own. His journey from the hard scrabble hills of Alabama to the top of the publishing world is American to the core. He traded in race and stereotypes. Carter has a little tree wearing deerskin leggings. No one in my family in the 1930s was wearing buckskins. Mastered the art of performance. He had this intuitive sense um, about, um, about the American public. Harness the power of words. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And use this knowledge to leave his past behind. That was last time I saw Asus when he got in that car. I think he was really had a mirror in front of himself and saying, what in the hell am I all about? He started out as one of the, the most extremist of the extremists, a, a Klansman, a raving anti-Semite. And then he morphs into this new age guru. And yet, it was the same person. It's all there when you look back. On a late summer morning in the small town of Clinton, Tennessee, 12 African-American students set off on one of the first attempts to integrate a high school in the South. Classes got underway without violence or protest. However, a group of men had traveled to town intent on stopping the integration. They handed out protest signs and organized nightly rallies where the white citizens of Clinton were introduced to Ace Carter. In the South, we have 98% Anglo-Saxon race, not counting the next. These are responsible people who erect free government and who have stood up and told the Negroes, you must operate, you must conduct yourself from a separate state. But the communist says, one world government, one world economy, one world geographically, and a one world race. In the 1950s and early 1960s, white Southerners really felt under siege. The Supreme Court decision had really ignited a kind of movement that, that was not going to stop. And there was a rage about how the poor white South had been oppressed by the federal government. The white people can't get no wealth south. Why don't we work on the west side? I can't get it, but I'm a white man. And Carter was able to tap into that, I think. He and some others at the time were kinds of geniuses at appealing to a very clear set of white paranoid concerns. One was sexual fears, among other things. What are your plans here in Clinton? Well, our immediate plans are the, is the immediate protection of our wives and our daughters and our mothers. In the other was economic competition between poor whites and poor blacks. If you were a white coal miner, you were constantly under threat of being replaced by a convict or a black worker at lower wages. Within a matter of days, the mood in front of the high school had changed dramatically. 
and the crowds at night were getting more and more arrested. Do you foresee any violence in the near future? If the men in public office do not do their duty, uh, violence is very probable. He didn't apologize for it. It was war to him. Segregation and integration were war to him. Well, I'm proud to be a redneck. My father's a redneck and my grandfather was a redneck. They have the principle of the Southland of freedom from government. They believe in racial integrity and a Christian ethic for a home. And if that's the slander, then heaven help us if we consider it such. And I'm saying nothing... Ace's public career had started two years earlier when he landed a job at a radio station in his home state of Alabama. I think in a lot of ways, he's able to create Forrest because he had already created a persona. This is Ace Carter. There is Asa Carter, the person. But more importantly to sort of 1950s and 1960s Birmingham, there is Ace Carter. And Ace Carter is also, I don't want to say fictitious, but certainly exaggerated. Carter used this persona to promote his message to white audiences throughout Alabama. You must conduct yourself a Asa Carter is a professional white supremacist. That's not to say he was not racist and anti-Semitic to the bone, but to Ace Carter and some others at the time, racism was their product. Racism was what automobiles were to car dealers. Over the years, he started a magazine, sold audio essays. Now, you may receive five essays by mailing in $1 per week or $4 for the complete month's essay. He even had a hotline. Ace had a recording that you could call and get our, our latest propaganda, you might say. And judging from the crowds that greeted him when he showed up in Clinton, Ace was a smashing success. We shall not submit to Negro dominion another day, another hour, another month. And if the federal government say this be treason, then let them hear it. Behind every ballot is a bayonet. Are you coward? Or are you an Anglo? <laughs> Grandma sang and rocked slowly back and forth, and I could hear the wind talking, and Lena, the spring branch, singing about me and telling all my brothers. I knew I was a little tree, and I was happy that they loved me and wanted me. Forrest Carter, the education of little tree. I tried to see him as that racist, but it just didn't fit as far as I knew. He was just quiet and, and uh, a very genteel person. I've never changed my feeling. I'm so glad I did get to meet him. Forrest Carter was very, very smart. He was an Indian at a time that Indians were hot in America. Forgive me for saying that, but that's the only way I can describe the atmosphere of the 70s. Sachin Littlefeather, an Apache Indian, turned up at the Academy Awards last The standoff continues at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. 200 Indians still occupy that small community, and federal marshals still surround them. You had a lot of, quote, hippies at that time wearing leather vests and love beads. There were experiments with communes that would suggest that they were a tribal kind of folk, and. Uh, Forrest Carter, he certainly was aware that that kind of movement was going on in America. Although 
Carter soon learned how marketable an Indian identity could be. Forrest started out as a pen name for his first book. If you look at the life story of Asa slash Forrest Carter, one of the things you see is a desire for celebrity, for being noticed. Tennessee and vulgarity of the rock and roll music. 
It is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with the Negro. I think he knew how to play the press more than anything else. He knew exactly what they would publish, what they were interested in. I think that's one reason he did the anti-rock and roll crusade. I've been looking into this rock and roll stuff, and believe me, what I see disgusting. But it was deeper than that, too. If white teenagers were willing to go to these concerts and listen to this music, they're willing to have social interactions as well. They're willing to, to, to accept African-American political gains. So I think Ace, in a sense, needed a grand gesture, something that would get the attention of the public beyond Birmingham, beyond Alabama. Nat King Cole was coming through the South on a big package show, and uh, there had been rumors that, uh, that something was in the works and something was going to happen there. That night, Nat King Cole was in the middle of the second song. Dear, when you smile at me, I heard a melody. And um, a few of Ace's um, stalwarts rushed the stage and tackled Nat King Cole on stage. There was a car waiting outside, and they had this, this nest of weapons outside. They had brass knuckles. They had a couple of uh, 22 rifles. God knows exactly what they were they were up to. Uh, what kind of guns are these? 22 rifles. Are they loaded? Fully loaded. Fully loaded. So Ace went down to the police station that night to see why his men were in jail and promptly started a white people's defense fund to take care of these political prisoners who had been, you know, thrown in jail for their political beliefs. This turns up in the New York Times, turns up in newspapers around the country. I think he was media savvy more than anything else. I, I think his years on the radio, I, I think his, his years with finagling these interviews as well. To help them organize Alabama, we have 69 white citizens council there. Ace was skilled at manipulating the media, but not at controlling the attention he got. The FBI was particularly interested in Ace's latest endeavor. Very few people understand that the Ku Klux Klan, from the time it was revived in 1915 to the present day, is a business enterprise. William J. Simmons, the founder of the modern Klan, was a defrocked Methodist minister who owned the factory that made the uniforms for the Ku Klux Klan post-1915. Once you got in a position to count the money, you now had the income stream. Carter sort of lost touch with mainstream in Alabama. And uh, most of my associates uh, didn't like him. He became too controversial in a sense. And Asa didn't like the guys in the White Citizens Council. They were the country club KKK. <laughs> and Asa had no respect for people like that and told them so. And said, if you believe in a cause, believe in it. I was a uh, patrolman at that time working Central Park which is out on 3rd Avenue West. There was an old movie theater there called the Central Park Theater. Right there, it was next to a little restaurant called the Chicken in the Rough. It was about 8.30 or 9 at night. I was pulling up to check it because I knew it was closed and I was wondering what was going on. And they were having a meeting there. There were rumors that Carter was stealing from the coffers, and one of the members demanded to have an independent accounting of the funds of the organization. And uh, although it's a little unclear as to how it happened, apparently um, Carter pulled out his uh, long barrel 44 and began shooting. One of the Klan members is shot and wounded. And people started running from the place. He uh, mounted what I think of as the Wizard of Oz defense, saying that he was actually in Tuscaloosa organizing at the time, and that the voice <laughs> heard from the stage was actually a recording. 
This is supposed to be a court of justice here. But the idea seems to be convict Asa Carter and make Asa Carter a criminal before the eyes of the people at all costs. Ace was lucky. Evidence was thin and eyewitnesses refused to talk. Though he was eventually acquitted, the damage to his public persona had already been done. If he was on the fringe, he was beyond the fringe uh, by then, because he was seen as the leader of these people. Out of the job and out of the spotlight, Carter would return home to the hills of northeast Alabama. It was where he had grown up and was now raising his own family. Ace was one of the most complex people I've ever known. And you wonder uh, if anybody ever really knew him. Sometimes I wonder if he ever really knew himself. You know, every time you meet somebody who, who knew Ace, had contact with Ace, you know, they, they always say the same thing, that I don't think I really knew the guy that, that well. And he's very slippery. Even the people who were supposedly close to him, his associates in the Klan or the Citizens Councils, it seemed like they can't cast too much light on it either. I've heard rumors that he, you know, was involved with some of the members' wives and things he's like a that. a regular suspect in many of these violent bombings. And then suddenly got into a fight after a poker game, and he had blown his son's leg off with a shotgun. I believe that uh, Asa was a double agent. Perhaps the only people that ever really knew Ace was his, his family. And he tried to keep them completely separate from this career as a race baiter, as a segregationist, uh, as a Klan member. While Ace was his public persona, Carter's family and friends knew a different man. They called him Bud and saw him at football games and attending services at the church his father helped build. So here's Bud, Asa, Ace, and Forrest. So here's a guy over the course of his life that really had four different names and went by four different things. Over the next few years, Carter would support his family by working on a dairy farm and then a bottling plant. So when the opportunity to make a comeback came, he took it. It was the spring of 1962, and George Wallace had launched his second campaign for governor of Alabama. The first time around, he was endorsed by the NAACP and had lost to an ultra-segregationist. Wallace was determined not to let it happen again. Wallace had made an appearance at the Anniston Courthouse. So um, Carter went up to Wallace with some sample speeches. And he said, um, call me, you know, if you like what you read. And Wallace used that material that night at the convention center in Gadsden. There are those who say, oh, it cannot be done. Well, in 1876, it was done. It was the Electoral College that took the Reconstruction troops out of this section of the country, and they removed the troops off of the backs of all the American people, wherever they might be in this country. Mm. Wallace called him that night and said, how soon can you get here? As would later happen with the outlaw Josie Wales, an unsolicited manuscript gave Carter a fresh start. Asa would uh, go to his hotel room, and he would write his speeches, and uh, nobody would, would be around him. He would take his typewriter, a couple of cartons of cigarettes, and maybe a little whiskey as well he would get sort of wound up. He would be just kind of red and work himself up into this almost 
physiological frenzy. He would be chain smoking and perhaps drinking. He would get on this kind of um, riding high, banging away at this stuff on a, on a steady diet of pall malls and vitriol. And he would work almost nonstop. If Asa Carter never written his speeches, he'd never been governor. When George Wallace started uh, speaking that afternoon, uh, he wanted to make a big show for the entire nation. Let us send this message back to Washington by our representatives who are here with us today, that from this day we are standing up, and the heel of tyranny does not fit the neck of an upright man. Ace turned in the speech, and he, supposedly he said this to Wallace himself. He thumped his finger at the lines and he said, those are the words that are going to get him. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. The crowd just roared. Thunderous applause. It paralleled a secret Klan saying, the Klan today, the Klan tomorrow, the Klan forever. Here's the governor of his home state standing on the steps, exactly where Jefferson Davis stood, saying his words. It's a moment that surely Carter remembered the rest of his life. The irony is, of course, he couldn't publicly acknowledge it. Asa Carter was never officially hired by George Wallace. He was always sub rosa. Uh, it was never acknowledged. He apparently never went on the state payroll. Uh, he was paid uh, under the table. If it had been widely known uh, that a former Klansman uh, was writing speeches for George Wallace, can you imagine the headlines that would have popped up uh, in papers around the country, even in the Alabama papers? Carter had a fundamental problem with his past. It still existed into his career as far as Carter. He was succeeding and making money, and his books were being published, and there was interest in Hollywood for other movies or TV series or miniseries, but he was facing a big chasm in the future if his past caught up to him. In the spring of 1974, the outlaw Josie Wells is about to come out, and Asa Carter walks into the FBI office. And Carter tells the agent that he is about to leave Alabama, and that if they ever need to reach him for any reason, he gives them two phone numbers. And the FBI agent, well, why would we want to contact you, Ace? He says, well, I think I'm going to start making some money for the first time in my life, and I don't want anything to screw it up. He has the foresight to understand what an FBI agent sniffing around might mean to his career. It would be the last entry in a file that stretched over a thousand pages. Carter should have played it safe and kept a low profile. But in fact, he did the opposite. Carter and his wife set off for West Texas. There, they joined his two sons, and they all played along as Forrest became much more than a pen name. I was the first to meet Forrest Carter. He walked into my store and asked me if I had a copy of Josie Wales. And he said, well, I'm Forrest Carter. I'm the author. <laughs> the physical transformation is remarkable. 
He no longer wears the white shirt and the, and the black tie and the, and, and the black suit, and he starts wearing cowboy kind of clothes and says dress-up clothes. Jeans and boots, and he had on a shirt that was real Western. Sort of like a vest jacket of some type and a hat. I think he wore a feather maybe in it. He had a mustache. Well, he was kind of, you know, his face was like he'd been out in the sun a lot. Very prominent cheekbones. Had very brown, leathery skin. He looked like what I had seen in the movies as Indians. This is when his sons become his nephews. I never heard him speak of having children or... How about his wife? Did you ever meet her? No. I did, I did once. Did you? Yes. He would talk about her, you know. She was a fine woman, and they would adopt kids, and she would take care of him, and, you know, he'd go out and make the money and all. I didn't even know he had a wife. She was with him and was his chauffeur. Well, I don't point. know. Under what circumstances? Yeah, I don't even know that for, for, for sure. I took him to this Italian restaurant, which was quite good, and we're sitting there eating, and suddenly he stood up and started doing Indian <laughs> chants and everything. And uh, Do you really feel like, Chuck, that he said, this is my wife? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe he, but... He would use Indian words all the time, but he must have really studied them or something because he, he really had it down, you know, the cadences and everything. The, spirits and all the stuff that come with her and you'd be I would suggest that Carter knew what stereotype he had to to present to uh, his his editor his publisher Mark Twain said that uh, people wanted the American Indian painted in essence, people wanted readily an American Indian stereotype rather than uh, the actual person. There was one commercial in the 1970s and featured a character known as Iron Eyes Cody. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. It turns out Iron Eyes Cody was actually an Italian. People start pollution. People can stop it. But he would put on beads and feathers and people would readily accept him as Indian. The education of Little Tree fits into that sort of magical, mystical idea of American Indian people. Little Tree had the ability to communicate with the trees, that they would talk to him and he could talk to the stars. I certainly wish that uh, I was magical and, and mystical, but I'm not, and I don't know any Cherokees that are. If we were, you know, there wouldn't be uh, many white people in America right now. I mean, that, that's my feeling about it. I was at home getting ready to go to work. And I got a call, and I don't remember whether it was from Oscar or Ray. They asked me if I had my television on. I said no, and said turn it on to channel 12, I believe. Good morning. This is today. I'm Barbara Walters with Jim Hart. There was Barbara Walters interviewing Ace <laughs> and uh, talking to him about how long Josie Wells. And I said to myself, this would be interesting. What in this new book? How he would be able to pull one over on Barbara Walters. He had on his cowboy thing in his hat, and his, that 10 gallon hat, and he was smiling pretty big. And looking down, he never would face a camera. She would ask him his questions Are you a real cowboy, Mr. Mr. C Bart Carter? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I was raised by my Cherokee grandparents, and, uh, and uh, they taught me a lot about uh, about life. I don't know how you found out about John uh, Josie Barnes. I had to laugh thinking about if Barbara Walters knew who she was really talking to, she, she, she'd be the trail out of that. <laughs> it's pretty clear that he likes the role of 
of a writer being at the center of attention in, in the same way that he liked the role of being a political leader in the 1950s and 60s. Even his high school classmates realized the, the theatrical flair of Carter at that time. His high school annual has uh, uh, some reference to him being an actor and he'll end up uh, in Hollywood someday. I think, it, I think it speaks volumes about our ability as individuals uh, in contemporary America to create who we are and what we stand for. And in so many ways, one of the most glaring examples of this is George Wallace himself. Our guest today on Meet the Press is Governor George C. Wallace of Alabama. This state is the only one in the country today whose schools are completely segregated. Next week, the issue heads for a climax when two Negro students will seek to enroll at the University of Alabama. A decade before he created Forrest, Carter learned a valuable lesson. The national media had descended upon the University of Alabama for the integration battle, and George Wallace was going to give him quite the show. George Wallace knew he was going to have to back down, but he thought his political future rests upon taking a public stand against uh, integration, confronting the federal government. Carter was a, a very useful kind of person in terms of making sure that the script, and that was a scripted confrontation, went as he wanted. The unwelcome, unwanted, unwarranted, and forced intrusion upon the campus of the University of Alabama, the end of the fight of the central government for the rightful example of the of the rights and privileges. Wallace timed the whole thing so that he could have a confrontation in the morning. Governor, I'm not interested in the show. I don't know what the purpose of the show is. I would ask you once again. And then he delayed his capitulation. And the image that was stuck in people's mind was of Wallace resisting, even though, in fact, he gave in. The pledge of segregation forever had lasted five months. And while the integration may have made Ace's stomach churn, the whole charade had worked perfectly. George Wallace was now more popular than ever. Soon they started thinking about running for president. Carter thought that Wallace would take his segregationist message national. I want to say this about race. I have never in my life made a speech that reflected upon anybody because of who they happen to be, and I don't intend to do so here in Missouri today. Now, but Wallace was embarking on yet another reinvention with the goal of becoming more palatable to a national audience. There was one speech that Carter had written to be used at Harvard, and uh, the afternoon that Wallace got ready to deliver it, he looked at it and said, this is not going to fly, because there was explicit, there was some explicit racial material in it. This is not race I'm talking about, and every time I mention this, they say this has racial overtones. When has it come to have racial overtones in this country to stand for law and order? Well, Asik would call me, you know, working for Wallace, and he would, you know, offer suggestions about this and that and the other thing. Wallace needs to say this. Governor Wallace needs to say that. And it was usually something extremely racist. No, I told you, I'm right, I'm right. Now you tell her And I finally didn't take his calls anymore because I was told not to by Governor Wallace and his assistants that we needed to keep him at arm's length. Mm -hmm. 
Asa was a very proud man. He resented that. And he was making a good living writing his speeches. He felt like, I guess, he had been used, that Wallace had used him and then dropped him. Oh, well, I would say I turned against George. He left the call, so he left me when he did. What has he done that, that you don't like, that you disapprove of? He's accepted integration. Uh, for the children, the schools. Of course, we can't have that. The following is a paid political telecast. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Asa Carter, candidate for governor. In the spring of 1970, Ace Carter returned to the public eye. He joined the crowded race for governor, taking on his old boss, George Wallace. They the civil rights bill. No one really paid any attention to Asa for many, many years. You know, maybe after laying low, he most likely craved the limelight again. In 1865, this state right here, after the war between the states, was occupied by a federal army. In one year, they confiscated 190,000 farms and homes from these poor old redneck great granddaddies of ours. But they refused to integrate. They refused to cooperate. In 1874, they whipped them. They whipped them. Ace crisscrossed the state, expecting the large, boisterous crowds of the 50s. But his words fell on deaf ears. They could go to any federal storehouse and draw shoes for our great-grandma's feet so they wouldn't have to go barefooted. They could go there and get cars so they wouldn't have to wear a toe sack for a dress. Once the majority society said, OK, the world has changed. We're going to live with it. Let's all get back to work and make some money the way they're doing in Atlanta. These old radicals became extremely expendable. Political messages get old. You have to be in touch with the times. And the times were just not uh, in Ace's favor. Alabama's Democrats have sent former Governor George Wallace, Governor Albert Brewer, into a second gubernatorial primary June 2nd. The five other candidates gathered enough support to keep either front runner from a clear majority. Ohio's primary voting produced... I think he came in last, maybe, among everybody in the, in the primary. I voted for him, uh, knowing he didn't have a chance, but I voted for him. I think at the end of his campaign, he realized a political battle to maintain white supremacy, to resist integration was over. And he's already begun that shift to the writer thing. A few days before the election, a subdued Carter had appeared on television for what would turn out to be the last time. If you'll excuse me a moment, I'll get this microphone on. Some people say, well, maybe Asa Carter would be governor next time. There's not going to be a next time. There's not going to be a next time. I appreciate you allowing me your home on this final telecast. And I certainly appreciate you remembering me and my family in your prayers. May God bless you. Thank you for listening. down from his reviewing stand on a number of integrated high school bands. Eight years ago, the schools were segregated, the bands were all white, there were no blacks permitted in this parade. It is one of the small signs of change that has taken place in eight years. I saw Asa among the crowd, and he had these, these signs, he and his buddies. You know, saying keep our our schools white. And after Wallace spoke at a, that afternoon late, I saw Asa. And we sat down on the stairs behind the Capitol. We sat there and, and talked. And uh, Asa talked. And Asa told me he said that uh, you know George Wallace is sold out. He said he's phony. He said he's just not the person he used to be. And he started weeping. I think he was really had a mirror in front of himself and saying, what in the hell am I all about? That was the last time I saw Asos when he got in that car. 
Every once in a while I'd hear from him, but very seldom after that. He had to move on for greener pastures. Oh, uh, they're saying uh, looking up taller trees for bigger berries. And that's when he started uh, writing. Soon after completing the novel, Carter left Alabama and left his life as ace behind. There is a remarkable parallel between his story and Josie Wales' story. The Josie Wales character refuses to go along with the new reconstructed South and instead moves to Texas. And gradually, uh, at the end of it, it's finally he achieves a new identity in Texas and puts his past behind him. He's no longer a wanted man. I think one of the key mysteries to Asa is that he had the spiritual capacity to create the kind of fiction he did. In the spring of 1975, Forrest finished up the education of Little Tree. It was unlike the violent westerns he had written, and his publishers were worried that it wouldn't find an audience. Once it came out, however many copies we printed were just gone like that. And we did a second printing immediately, and that was gone. It just wouldn't stop selling. Colleges and universities are using it in Native American studies classes. Tommy Toon wanted to make it into a Broadway musical. There was talk about turning it into a ballet. My reaction really has been to say, there was something good in Forrest Carter, or he would not have been able to write this book. I truly believe that Forrest Carter was trying to establish a new beginning. He, I think he wanted something more himself. We had him to our home. I cooked supper for him, and uh, everybody would say, Forrest is here, and they all wanted to gather around and hear his latest tale. And my father was dying of terminal cancer, and Forrest wrote me some of the most wonderful, heartwarming, comforting letters I've ever that man could write. For the Cherokee, and underneath that he's written, and for a fellow Texan and my friend Bob Daly, good trails, Bob, and cool water where you rest. To my friends Chuck and Betty, thank you for your many kindnesses. He said to Bob St. John, said at the cross trails where we've met, the fire has been warm, the wind soft, the water sweet, the smoke talk has been good, compadre, Forrest Carter, Little Tree. As far as, uh, you know, uh, a change of heart, uh, finding the light. Carter would have had to have apologized. He would have had to have renounced his past. He didn't, he didn't renounce his past, he just walked away from it. Can we ever know the real ace? I mean, is, is it possible to know someone who, who seemed to go to great lengths to, to mask who they really were, to present a different front to different people. Is it even possible to know someone like that? In 1970, we had a, a representative named Ray Burgess. Ray told friends uh, this story. Asa Carter was asked to give the keynote address at a big racist convention in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, Ace wrote the speech, and then he asked Ray to give it. And uh, when he 
got to the convention. Ray gave it everything he had, and he had those old boys standing on their chairs, practically, whistling and cheering and whooping. And uh, after the convention, he turned to Ace and said, Ace, I don't understand you. If I could write a speech that good, I wouldn't give it to anybody else. I'd give that speech myself. And Ace turned to Ray and said, Ray, to really give a speech like that, you've got to believe that shit. just an old rebel, reckon that is all I am. For this carpetbagger government, I do not give a dad blame. I'm glad I fit again it, I'll keep fighting till we won. And I don't want no pardon for nothing that I done. No, I don't want no pardon for what I was nor what I am. And I won't be reconstructed and, and I don't give a dad blame. <laughs> This is Asa Carter. May God bless you, and I thank you for listening. For more information about the reconstruction of Asa Carter and other ITVS programs, visit ITVS online at itvs.org. Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by 